So this is the studio. The goal is to build a composing studio and the $1,000. This tree. I've never done an unboxing in my entire life, so don't, uh, don't judge my unboxing skills. So this is a screen. All right, I think this will do. It's pretty thin for $97 a screen. And this is the computer. This guy cost, I think it was $600. And the funny thing about this is I just bought a new graphics card for my studio and it cost more than this computer itself and um, what happens with technology is that the higher end that you go there's this the law of diminishing return um, which the more and more expensive you get it gets a little bit better but the return is, is smaller so so this is the computer and we're gonna give this away. We're gonna build this studio, we're gonna test this studio, we're gonna make it work, and then we're gonna give everything away. <gasps> so, so comment down below. Give it away? Yeah. Okay. So if you want this, comment down below and we'll select one of you and we'll, we'll send this to you. Uh, we've got this little guy, that I think it cost like, like $40 or so. Let's see what this is made of. The thing that I liked about this guy is it's got the mod wheel and it comes with Cubase LE. In terms of software, we're gonna use either Cubase or Sonar or Reaper, but I guess one of the three. And then for the library, we're gonna use Nucleus. I don't remember what this is. Oh yeah. I bought two audio interfaces. This is not the best, but we are on a budget and this will do. Let's see. These are the headphones, um, cheap headphones. I think they are, um, they're $50. I chose these ones because um, these are supported headphones by um, Sonar Works, they have a correction curve for this, for these headphones. I wouldn't go with these ones for me, but when I moved here in the US in 2009 and I was in a budget, these were actually the ones that I bought and they served me well for a while. So we've got a computer, we've got this guy, keyboard, we're gonna connect this uh, USB to here, we're gonna connect this here, and I think we're done. This is not for the studio. <laughs> this is not for the studio. <laughs> the reason why I bought this computer is because it's upgradable. It comes with Windows 10. It has the 10th generation of the i5 um, CPU. I don't know if you could replace it for the i7 later on, but it also comes with 12 gigs of RAM and then uh, like half terabyte of SSD drive. For the same price, you could have bought the new Mac mini with the M1 processor, but that thing is not upgradable. Um, so, Let's see how this performs. So we're gonna take over my wife's desk. Let's get this started. So for the library, we're gonna have Nucleus Lite from Audi Imperia. Got two HDMI outputs, so you could connect two screens without a graphics card. But if you were to stream with this computer, I recommend the, the NVIDIA cards that has the N-band code because um, it takes care of encoding and decoding if you're streaming. If you're composing and the streaming or teaching at the same time, the CPUs are gonna be powerful enough. So you could fit one of these in this desktop. The cool thing about this setup is that basically it's just one or two cables that you'll plug to the power outlet and that's it. With a system like that one, there are so many moving pieces. Starting a studio from scratch, it's, um, it's nice because you realize how simple it really is at least at the beginning. The audio interface is already working. That means it's plug and play. And I think I have to turn this guy on. I guess this button, yep. When we are done with this, we're gonna install Cubase LE that comes with this guy. And I've got the, the access code here. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna install Chrome and then I'm gonna download and install Cubase LE contact player and uh, Nucleus Lite. While this is downloading, it's gonna take a while. We're gonna take a look at the specs of this computer. This is the i5-10400. Uh, we've got 12 gigs of RAM. Let's see how this does. Um, I always say that 16 is the minimum, but because we're not gonna start with a lot of libraries, I think we can do with this. Now we can upgrade this computer later on to 24 or 48 gigs of RAM. This is the hard drive, half terabyte of SSD drive, which is good. So while this downloading is halfway, we're gonna download Sonarworks reference for the version that we're gonna download is gonna be the cheapest one. We're gonna go with the headphones version of this guy because 
you don't have the speakers. They've got two versions. They've got the studio version and the headphone version. If you get the studio version, it comes with a mic and then you'll take the measurements of the different points in your studio and then it'll, it'll, it'll create a custom core for your speakers and your room and your seating position. The reference for headphones. So it's $99, but quick promo. If you're a cinematic composing student, you can get this with this uh, educational discount. But $60 I think it is. Cubase is installing and I installed all the sound packages. I usually wouldn't do that um, in my system because I, I know that I don't, I'm not gonna use these sounds but because we are starting from scratch here the library that we have is small and limited. It's good but small and limited, Nucleus Lite. I'm gonna install all the sound packs and I'm gonna investigate a little bit what they've included in this version and let's see if we find anything usable. All right, so we've bought and downloaded and installed everything at this point, it's the last step. I'm installing the Nucleus Light Edition inside Contact and this will show up here as soon as it's installed. While I wait, I'm gonna go to Edit, Preferences, and then I'm gonna go to Transport and I'm gonna select Return to Start Position. And the second thing that I'm going to activate is I'm gonna go here to Edit, I'm gonna go down here, Key Commands, I'm gonna look for Retrospective Recording and is this one here, MIDI, Retrospective Record Insert from all MIDI inputs and I'm gonna change this Shift number and I'm gonna replace it by this R. It's one of the most important things for me because the way I compose is I hit Play, then I record something if I like it, I'll hit R and then it gets recorded. That's it. But if I don't like it, I'll record, I'll hit play, I'll record something. I don't like it, just two clicks. One, two, record the same thing. Ah, it doesn't work. One, two, I'll record something. And then when it works, I hit R and then it gets recorded. All right, so Sonar Works Reference Force installed. And basically the way this works is you're gonna go here to open profile and then you're gonna select the headphone that you have. In my case, is the K72. And then you're gonna go here, you're gonna select the K72, this one here. It's gonna tell you, see, this is the curve of your speaker. I'm going to load this curve, this correction to counterbalance. And then the final result is gonna be this line here. And it's not ideal. It's always better to have the best speakers and that treated room. But if you're on a budget, this is a great option. So just for a quick demonstration, I'm gonna turn on the speakers. Now check this out. If I switch back and forth, this is without the effect and this is with the effect. You will see that with the effect, it sounds actually worse. It's because the correction is meant for these guys, not for the speakers. But just so you can hear the difference, this is without. With. Big, big difference. And that's gonna make me be able to trust these guys. Even though they are not the most expensive, most reliable headphones with the correction, I can trust them a little bit better. All right, so the first thing that we're gonna do is I'm gonna set up a small template. So when I start composing, I've got everything ready to go. Yes, when I'm composing, I'm gonna be changing and tweaking things, but it's gonna be a good starting point. First of all, let's find out what limitations we've got here. With this version of Cubase, I'm limited to eight instrument tracks. Now. If I run out of a space, I can print that to audio and then I can keep going. I also have a limit on how many audio tracks I can have, but let's see how far we can get with these limitations. We will be able to compose this piece with eight tracks. Now, it's gonna be slightly limited and I would like to have a little bit more flexibility. So even though with eight tracks, we could have everything that we need, right? Brass, woodwinds, strings, short notes, brass, woodwinds, strings, long notes, and we still have two extra tracks available. I would like to have a little bit more flexibility. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna load a instrument track and then I'm gonna create one, two or three MIDI tracks underneath that are gonna be routed to this instrument track. So then I can separate, for example, for like this strings short, I can separate the high, mid and low or high and low strings. And why would I want to have this amount of separation? Well, let's say that I'm done composing and now I'm mixing and I have let's say the highest staccato strings and the lowest staccato strings, having those two separate tracks will allow me to do things like reposition just a tiny bit, the highest staccato strings a little bit more to the left, and then the lowest staccato strings a little bit more to the right. Or maybe for example, I've separated the brass short high, brass short low and brass melody. Now I can separate that melody and I can treat it differently. Maybe that melody needs a little bit of reverb because I exported it separately and because I created separation here, now during the mixing process, I can apply different things. Or I can even add a little bit of extra volume automation to that horn's melody because I have separation, I have control over that 
musical element. Another thing that I'm gonna do is for the percussion, I'm gonna load more than one pad inside contact. So for example, I've got the atonal percussion and the glockenspiel because the atonal percussion is down in the register in the keyboard and the glockenspiel is higher in the register. So effectively I've got two instruments. I'm just loading one contact, but I actually have access to Grand Casa, Nurse, Piatti and Tam Tam and the glockenspiel. So it's five instruments, just one contact instance. Another thing that I'm doing is I'm adjusting the reverbs. So for example, for the longest strings inside Nucleus, I'll have a little bit of a longer hold type of reverb. For the, for the shorter strings, maybe I'll have no reverb or a shorter room type of reverb. For low percussion, no reverb. For uh, the glockenspiel, tiny bit of reverb. Now, as soon as I'm done composing, I'm gonna move to mixing. When I export the audio files for mixing, I'm gonna turn on all the reverbs so I can apply my own reverbs later on when I'm mixing. One thing that I was worried about is that I don't have a horns pad and I felt that I would need a horns pad for this piece. But the cool thing is that in this library, when you get to the horns range in that middle C, it pretty much feels like just horns. When you go higher in register, you can he start hearing the trumpets a little bit, but it doesn't bother me. As long as you stay within the horns range, it's gonna sound pretty much like horns. So with this template in place, the next step is gonna be start composing. I'm gonna go for trailer style. It's gonna be orchestral, big emotional trailer type of music. So let's get into it. This is the composition. Now, before I show you the composition, a few things. I've been working with this computer for almost a month now. I've done part of the documentary here. So, uh, things that I like and things that I don't like. First of all, the thing that I'm most impressed about is the computer. It's able to handle a lot. I've always had i7s and i9s. This is an i5, so I didn't know what to expect. Good, it worked well. Actually, this Q if I come here to the climatic moment and I go to the CPU, it's not using 16, 17%, maybe 20, 22 at some times. We are using six of the 12 gigs of RAM. The things that I didn't quite like that much about the setup is this little guy here, especially. It gets the job done, um, but a couple of things. The mod wheels precision, it's not great. In fact, if you, if you come here, you see this part is recording mod wheel from the MIDI controller. And you can see how it's not recording all the points in between. This is the way it looks when I'm using my MIDI controller in my main studio. And this is the way it should look. And another thing, I hated not having control. Um, this is the guy that I use in my main studio. And I use this one for expression modulation, different MIDI controls, MIDI CCs. And in here I just had modulation, I just had the mod wheel, which, um, it felt a little bit limited. It's not the end of the world, but when I'm using something like this, I can record several things at the same time. Maybe I'll have crossfading plus volume automation plus vibrato. It's gonna give me a more realistic performance. All right, so that's it. It's time to see what this little setup can do. That's it. I finally didn't mix the music as I mentioned earlier because I already put so many hours in this video but because I didn't mix it, these are the two main biggest limitations that I found. Number one, separation. Separation in panning and volume. Because we just had eight tracks, I had to group together things, not just instruments, but also musical ideas. So for example, with the staccato strings, because we are using ensemble patches, the problem with the ensemble patches is that they don't give you a lot of separation. It's not gonna, you're not gonna hear the violins one, violins two, violas, etc. right? As opposed as you were using individual sections. But even with this library that has ensemble patches, if I had more tracks, I could load separate 
ensemble patches and I can reposition them a little bit and gain a little bit of separation. And so for example, for the staccato strings, I have the two inner ostinatos that we don't hear them very clearly because of that problem. I could have, if I had more tracks, I could have repositioned them and balanced them in terms of volume as well. And we lost a little bit of clarity there. Um, for the horns though, I decided to have one track just for the horns ensemble because I wanted to have control over that melody, but that was the only instrument that I actually had in one separate track. I also had a low staccato brass track that I removed and I replaced it with the low pulsing synth just because the brass was adding as much as the low pulsing synth. It was more meaningful, so I left this one because I just had eight tracks. And I know that I could have printed that track to audio, or if I would have mixed it, I would could have explored different tracks and I would have had more separation, but I wanted to test how far we could get with just eight instruments. So that was limitation number one. Limitation number two was the headphones, very nice, especially with the reference for curve correction, Fantastic. Actually, I listened to the track later on in my system and it traduced very well. The only problem was the low end. I couldn't hear that much the low end. So if you hear closely, uh, the low pulsing bass comes a little bit hot in the mix. All right, so enough talking because this video is long enough already. So we're gonna give this away. So if you want it, just post a comment in the comments section below. We'll select one and we will send it your way. And hopefully this video comes to show that it's not as much about the equipment that makes the biggest difference, but how you use the equipment. So if you wanna learn to compose and you wanna know how I compose this track, we've got a one hour free training that shows everything from creating the sketch, harmony to create emotions, counterpoint, orchestrating, synchestrating. If you're interested, click the link in the description. And that's all from me. If you found value, consider subscribing, like to support this video, and I'll see you in the next one. <laughs>